Good afternoon, this is Angela with Park Rose Permaculture. I thought today would be a good time to sit down and talk about a subject that is very near and dear to my heart and that I um, promised y'all I would be talking about. And I would love your input and feedback because I think it's a really complicated issue. And that is, should permaculturists keep honeybees? Should any of us be keeping honeybees? in North America. Obviously, the situation would be different in Europe where they are native, but here in North America, the honeybee is an introduced species and there has been a huge push in um, the last 10 years to save the honeybees, followed by a secondary wave of very strong opinion that we should not be keeping honeybees at all and that they don't have a place here. So before we get into the push to save the honeybees and then the blowback and um, criticism of beekeeping, I thought I would just briefly talk about why I'm a beekeeper, why I got into it, and what I get out of it. So I began beekeeping several years ago because I was really afraid of bees. I was afraid of being stung by bees. When I get stung on the hand, I will swell all the way to the elbow. And um, so I have what you would call a moderate localized reaction. Just because clinically it's moderate, that doesn't mean it's pleasant. So I had a pretty strong fear of bees. But as a gardener and somebody who's outside and working amongst flowers all day long, it has a strong intellectual respect for the power of pollinators. I knew that I needed to overcome my fear of bees and I figured the best way to do that was to become a beekeeper and have to interact with them on a regular and intimate basis. So there was a store here in Portland that my friend Matt owned that was just, he's just a fantastic beekeeper and such an inspiration um, called Bee Thinking. And um, one of my children was also interested in beekeeping at that time. And so we took his beekeeping class in his shop and I learned a lot. And um, I really decided that the right kind of beekeeping for our family was top bar beekeeping. So I currently have two top bar hives. I have a cathedral hive and I have a Kenyan top bar hive. And you may be familiar with the traditional Langstroth commercial beekeeping style of um, hive. And we used to have one of those and I actually gave it to a friend because after a while I realized it wasn't working for us. And the reason that I'm a top bar beekeeper is I feel like it's more ecologically in keeping with how uh, bees live in the wild, how they build their comb out. So I feel like it's more bee friendly. The second reason is it's much more kid friendly. A top bar is a single bar and the comb is built by the bees off the bottom of it and you lift out one bar at a time and a bar loaded with honey weighs about seven pounds and that's very workable for a child to um, handle a bee colony when you're talking about seven pound increments when you're looking at lifting a langstroth super full of honey you're looking at easily 60 pounds or more and you have to lift off the boxes to get to the what are called the deeps underneath. So if you are interested in getting into beekeeping and you have children, I highly recommend looking at top bar hives. The other reasons that I like top bar hives are you can build them yourself with simple hand tools and they work really well for foundationless beekeeping. So I don't use any plastic in my hives because bees don't like plastic and it's thought to increase fungal problems, make it harder for bees to regulate the temperature inside their hives and encourage varroa mites. So I use foundationless um, methods of beekeeping so the bees can build their comb to the shape and size and with tunnels in it as they see fit, little highways through the um, different bars. In becoming a beekeeper, I basically had some um, pretty radical uh, immersion um, therapy and was able to overcome my fear of bees. Being stung a number of times helps. I was desensitized and also just interacting with the bees, learning to speak their language, helped me gain a lot of respect and take away a lot of the fear I have for honeybees. So I fully admit, as I go into this conversation, I have a strong bias toward honeybees because 
they produce honey for me, they increase pollination in my garden significantly, and they have been a really enjoyable hobby for me and a really enjoyable experience and a really healthy experience. So what we noticed in the mid 2000s through the early 20 teens is that there was a huge rise in the cultural consciousness about the plight of bees. We knew bees were declining significantly. We knew that things like colony collapse disorder and spraying of unsafe pesticides on flowering plants was having a huge impact on our bees. We saw it in everything from Doctor Who episodes to articles in the local newspaper to public service announcements about the plight of our honeybees. We saw several good documentaries come out about bees and that coincided with an increased interest in beekeeping, right? We need to save these bees. They're good for us. They produce honey, they produce propolis, they produce wax, and they pollinate our food crops. Why would we not want to have them? So as with any kind of social or ecological movement, um, we see an increased interest. And at the same time, then that is going to bring about, rightly so, some thoughtful criticism. With beekeeping, the criticism has been bees are an invasive species, which they are not. They're an introduced species and they compete with native pollinators and therefore they are a problem and we should not keep bees. So in North America, there are more than 3,000 species of native bee. Many of them are solitary. You have ground nesting bees of many species. You have uh, mason bees and we have carpenter bees and bumblebees of several species. There are so many kinds of native pollinators and they fill a broad variety of niches in the North American landscape. And that's not including things like birds and beetles and um, surfid flies that are also pollinators, wasps that are also pollinators. Let's just stick to bees for the purpose of this video. So I've seen lately, the last two years or so, a significant number of posts in permaculture groups and regenerative agriculture groups saying we should not keep bees, they are a problem. So I want us to be really cautious when we talk about the negative impacts of honeybees. Are those negative impacts that the bees are having or are those really negative impacts that humans have created, both by our choice to introduce honeybees, but also in the way we look at and manage the landscape? Permaculture says the problem is the solution. So how can we take a problem, if it actually is a problem, which is honeybees competing with native bees and create a solution? There have been a few studies, and I will link to them in the description, that point to the fact that some of our honeybees do compete with some of our native bees for flowers. And the solution that has been put forward is then we stop beekeeping. I would posit a different solution, which is why don't we just plant more freaking flowers? Why don't we just have more food so that there is not a limited amount, a finite amount of flowers you can grow? What is the limiting factor here? It is the source of food. Is that the fault of our introduced bees that we are responsible for? No, it's not. And does that mean the solution is then to stop beekeeping and kill bees? I would disagree. I would say the solution is let's grow more flowers. Let's grow more flowering things, food crops and native plants. There is no limit to the amount of fertility and abundance we can have. So why should we act like there is a finite amount of flowers that we can grow? In fact, as humans, we are reducing the amount of habitat and reducing the amount of flowers. And that is our fault. That is not the fault of the honeybees. So instead, let's take a new angle. Let's try and increase the amount of pollination we have by increasing the amount of flowers and therefore providing ample habitat, ample forage for our bees. Swarms are the way that bees naturally, honeybees naturally reproduce. And the queen and a, a, an entourage will um, alight somewhere on a tree, on your barbecue, on your car bumper, um, on the eaves of a house. And they will figure out from there where they want to go and set up a colony. But we have 
massively depleted the number of snag trees, old dead trees, suitable habitat for bees to take up residence in the wild. So when we choose to abdicate our responsibility of caring for the insects that we have released into our landscape, especially when they are an insect that came here with us pr sort of having a contract, right? We have a social contract with bees. You are not native here. You require a hive in which to live. We are bringing you here as our livestock and we will therefore house you. When we abdicate that responsibility, what we find is that those swarms that alight on the eaves of a house move into the walls of a house or move into the ceiling of a grocery store or move into your garage, somewhere where they suddenly become a pest and a nuisance. One of the obligations we have is, as uh, gardeners, permaculturists, beekeepers, humans, is that we continue to promote the hobby of beekeeping so that bees have homes. And when I do that, I am taking a colony that otherwise will become an expensive problem for somebody and I'm giving it a safe home. So we need to continue to uphold our end of the deal and provide them with homes because there are insufficient places in the wild due to human depletion of appropriate habitat. There are not good, um, sufficient and good locations in the wild for bees to have a home, but we can give them homes, keep them out of the walls of buildings and use them as a resource. Let's talk really quickly about the differences between sustainable beekeeping and migratory beekeeping. You cannot compare hobby beekeeping, backyard beekeeping, to the migratory industrial beekeeping model. Those are two entirely different things. The way that I keep chickens is nothing like factory farmed chickens. They are not the same at all. Oh, I have a dog visiting. Um, hold tight. There are some really good documentaries that are now a little bit old, but still totally relevant and totally accurate about the problems of migratory beekeeping. If you are seeing folks criticize beekeeping based on that model, I would encourage you to think about it the same way you think about backyard chicken keeping and the industrial factory farmed CAFO model of keeping chickens. They are not the same thing at all. It's very much the same way that the share of grass-fed, grass-finished beef that we buy from a local farmer who keeps a small, sustainable herd of beef cattle is not the same thing as buying feedlot beef. Those are two entirely different practices and you cannot lump them in together. So when we are talking about beekeeping, I have strong objections to migratory beekeeping. It is not sustainable. It is um, enforcing a monoculture heavy pesticide, heavy herbicide, heavy petroleum use method of producing food. And it is not how the bees would choose to live. And it is entirely unsustainable. And I am sure it is contributing to problems with native bees. What I wanna talk about here is the permaculture method of keeping bees, which would be a sustainable, specific site designed appropriate um, scalable model of beekeeping that fits within the landscape and benefits the landscape and does not harm it. So for me, that's two hives. I have a permit for two hives in my backyard and that's it. That's all the space I have. I need to make sure I can provide forage and water and appropriate presentation in the landscape in terms of where the wind and the sun are. I feel that when we're talking about permaculture beekeeping, we have to keep the permaculture principles in mind or we are not talking about sustainable beekeeping. So if we're looking at the fact that honey is a highly local, highly sustainable, culturally appropriate, much more health conscious choice as a sweetener for our foods versus the refined white sugar that Americans are so infatuated with, Let's look at that as part of our um, whole portfolio when we're looking at the choice to continue to keep bees. But also let's just focus on the fact that bees can be a fantastic 
spokesperson, spokesbee for all our bee species so that when we are talking to the general public and we are addressing this heightened raised consciousness of how great honeybees are for people and that they are struggling due to human choices and human agricultural um, unsustainable practices, that can push all of us towards sustainability in terms of how we grow food, how we manage our landscapes, but also it can be a push toward sustainability and conservation for all bees. I don't know anybody that is a beekeeper who has not become fascinated with all our native bees and become much more knowledgeable about them. I would not have become interested in all our solitary bees and our bumblebees to the degree that I am if I had not become a beekeeper. Because once you begin to have an intimate relationship with your bees and your bee colonies and become concerned for their welfare, what you find is that you are suddenly looking everywhere in the landscape is a place that I can be looking and noticing what pollinators are doing. And I can be thinking about solutions that increase their welfare and create an optimal situation for them in my permaculture design. So my own personal awareness of what is going on with native bees and what they need to thrive and do well has increased exponentially since I became a beekeeper. And I know that in general, that's true for anybody I know that's a beekeeper. It has made us far more interested in all our native pollinators. So we can harness that. We can harness the fact that bees are already here. The problem is the solution. And we can use our honeybees to help promote the message of conservation of all of our native bee species so that we can do right, not only by the honeybees that we have brought here, that we have an obligation to take care of, that provide useful resources and useful um, powers for us in terms of pollination and food production, but we also can use them as an advocate for our native bees and continue to conserve and restore and regenerate spaces for all our bee species. So, end of this very long video, what I would say is in permaculture, we should be keeping honeybees, not only because they benefit us as permaculturists and benefit our local gardens, but also, and our benefit our bellies as well, but also because honeybees as an introduced species have the potential to help be a solution for the problems all of our bees are facing, all of the human-made problems our bees are facing. So if you have thoughts on beekeeping or your beekeeping experiences or um, have a difference of opinion and that you want to talk about, I'm totally open to that. Totally acknowledge that our native bees are struggling and they need our help, but I don't think the right solution is to get rid of beekeeping and I don't think the right solution is to um, abandon our honeybees that we have already released into the North American landscape. But I think that there are great permaculture solutions that call on us as humans to engage responsibly with our ecosystems, engage responsibly with the introduced species we have brought here. And we can use that to create more abundance and more resilience for us and for all of our native species. So thanks for watching. I hope you'll check out some of my videos on beekeeping. Um, my eldest daughter and I have put out a couple of them, um, maybe, it will spark your interest in learning more about top bar beekeeping and backyard beekeeping. I'll be back soon with another video from the garden. Thanks.